We're going to just spend the next, I think, half an hour uh, doing a little fireside chat. Scott is in the audience, so if you have a question, you can raise your hand. Um, he's also farming questions through the crowd mic function in your app. But I'm just going to sort of throw one at you um, to begin with. I, I really loved that you kind of talked about emotional, functional, and identity kind of benefits, right, to drive consumer demand. Can you talk about that more in the context of credit unions? Which, ones, which one do you think is really relevant for the credit union consumer? Um, well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, again, I have to just say I am a relative newbie to your space. But thinking about it as an outsider, I would say functional is very, very clearly there, right? Because the functionality is you offer something better than the banks offer, whether it's about rates or whether it's about you know, the process or whatever. So functional, very clearly there, you'll be able to pick up on that. But I really think the thing that you've been missing is the emotional. Um, now, I don't know whether people, when you talk about identity, I don't know whether people are desperate to walk around with a t-shirt that says, hey, I love the Kraft Credit Union or whatever. Don't know. Think we'd have to make the right t-shirts, to be honest, to make that make any difference. But I do absolutely believe that the emotional benefit of a caring bank, of a bank that is really focused on how to make my life better, how to educate me better, how to educate my kids better about their financial futures um, is something that would really resonate. And it would have, you know, the, it's interesting, the famous Kellogg marketing professor, Philip Kotler, he says, the future of all marketing is meaning. Hmm. And I think that when you think about meaning, you have those two elements to play with. You have both function and you also have the emotional benefit. So what kinds of what kind of marketing initiatives have you seen that have harnessed the emotional benefit in a good way? I mean, like, should we be doing social media? Should we be out on the street? Should we be knocking on doors? Like, how do we actually do that? Well, I think the truth is that um, those are the tactics that you deploy once you actually know what it is you want to stand for. Mm -hmm. The big question first is you have to decide what is it that really matters. So I was on the, the team um, at Unilever when we started pushing um, girls' self-esteem, right? Um, and I had done the research to figure out, you know, 85% of our consumers are females, um, and uh, we've got, uh, a lot of them are worried, one of the growing issues at that point, this was in the, you know, 2000s, um, the early 2000s, it was uh, all around, you know, girls' self-esteem. And so as we began to evolve that platform, and I took it through the foundation, it also became very clear that actually that was a great space for Dove, right? And so Dove took that, and I think you all know about the real beauty work, um, and that just catapulted that brand, particularly in America, but around the world. Um, and so that's one where they really took an emotion uh, and, they, and they drove it. Um, and I think that the question is, what is your equivalent of self-esteem? Um, and I, I am gonna posit that it is going to have to be somewhere in the space of whether you want to call it financial literacy, financial education, something, because you are a financial institution. So to be core to what you do, it's probably going to be somewhere in there. But I also want to be very clear that I think that's at a platform level that is not necessarily at a programmatic level. Because finance, to me, is the underpinning of every healthy community and every healthy family, right? It is the bedrock. Without it, things fall apart. So helping at that, at whatever level, you are actually improving the well-being, right? Um, and you can target it however you want, but I think creating the financial bedrock and financial stability of communities and of families and of individuals um, is somehow going to be one of the social benefits you're going to look to deliver. I just don't know how you make it relevant yet across all of your various audiences. And of course, we want to wait till we get the research back, because if we just jump to that, then we're, of course, doing what everybody's done for decades, and it hasn't necessarily worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Scott, do you have questions yet, or should we keep going? So it's a, a, there's a common question, which is we're going through the whole week, and that is um, the story of Credit Union is quite universal. Everyone here in this room buys into it. But how do they get better at communicating that? Hmm. So um, what I'd be interested in is when you walk into your branch, OK? So again, I don't know that much about your space, but when you communicate with me, let's, so when I go get my account, you know, next week in Annapolis, Maryland, am I, what, how are you going to communicate with me? When I walk into this branch, right, what am I going to see? Where is going to be the information around what you stand for, what you believe in, why you exist, your mission, your history, your values, right? Is that going to be really right there where I can't miss it? That's one thing. Second thing, as you engage with me, 
to what extent while I'm trying to open my account, are you actually helping me understand what my options are, actually getting to know me as an individual? Um, you know, we heard earlier, and I thought you made a great point, um, Sarah, where you said, you know, maybe, maybe we're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. There are certainly people who don't want to come to a branch. I completely agree with you. Um, but I think that if we're going to have physical spaces, we've got to figure out the question more is, how do we then make the physical spaces useful, right? So you have this great opportunity when I'm sitting in front of you to be talking to me about things more than than just the rate you're going to give me, right? So that's a second interaction point. The third interaction point is, how do you send me statements or communicate with me or all of those things? Is there any communication or demonstration of your values and your purpose and what you believe in and what you stand for in the ways in which you engage with me? Because that would be the starting point, I would think, in terms of how do you demonstrate this. And yes, that could include social media. Depends on who your audience is, right? If you've got an older audience, a younger audience, you've got to go where your audience is. You all know your audience better than anybody else. Um, but you have a 1,000 touch points, I would argue, and I don't know how many of them you're really using to talk about things that are more emotional or identity-oriented as opposed to the pure function. Yeah, and I, just, to, just to like hammer my pet peeve here is every time I go to a credit union site, your purpose is on your about page. And when you say, you know, is the purpose front and center where I can see yeah, it? In not the on branch, the about page. Is it, is it also in the digital space? Is it's, it's a front page thing, this yes. purpose thing. You lead with it. It's not an add-on like you were saying. Correct, correct. Um, it's the heart of your business. And the truth is, everybody else is trying to make that the heart of their business, right? Um, but you don't have to. Um, it's like, I think you guys saw the video, right? Unilever, it was the heart of their business from the beginning. That makes it so much more credible. It's easier to move the employees that way, it's easier to move the investors that way, and it's easier to get consumers to believe you. Preach it, Perry. Hey, Sarah. A question from Sam Daniel. Yeah, Sam. I, wanted, I think this is a really great point and that I wanted to dig into a little bit because when we had the focus group yesterday, uh, we heard the consumers that were in the room say, I can't tell when I go to a credit union that it's really any different than a bank. And that to me is, it isn't just pushing message out, it's how is the experience purpose driven? How would you immediately know that through any way that you would engage with that credit union? So I think it's a great point that you make, Perry, and, and any way that we can continue to explore that or have our audience think about those ways that you can tell the credit union story and how we're different. That way, you're, you're not making your member work to find out about that mission. So I guess it's a comment. <laughs> Let's have a question. A good one. Okay. That's, it's, it's a great one in terms of experience feeling. Yes. Just the feeling of the building when I walk into the room. What does yep. it smell like? What does it feel like? Is, it, is there a rug? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it you is. Know? It really is a full sensory experience yeah. when, you, when you think about it. I mean, we saw all those um, pictures earlier about, and I think a lot of us were thinking, gosh, wouldn't it be fun to work for whichever company it was that had, like, all of that super cool, uh, oh, Pixar, right? Because, like, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, I was thinking my 12-year-old really would love to work for Pixar. Um, uh, but, you know, it's what is your unique look and feel, um, and how do you present that? in a way, and I'm thinking like, I want the smell of coffee, right? I want the smell of something where um, it, it makes me feel at home and in a trusted, safe environment um, where I can still do business. Interesting. So another question coming in from the audience. Yeah. Should credit unions reassess their charity initiatives to be more in line with the credit union story? Okay, uh, I don't have the research back yet, but I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say absolutely, okay? I just. I have to say, I, the ones that really work, that end up driving the needle, are ones that are consumer or customer driven, when you specifically ask about purchase, right? If you're asking, do you like me? If you're asking, am I friendly? If, you know, would you work here? Those are different objectives. But if you are trying to actually get new consumers or more business from your existing consumers, those are, it's a very specific objective, and you need to ask about that. But what I would tell you is, um, I would be really surprised, and there will be some exceptions to this, there are certain communities where it will be uh, an exception, but I'd be really surprised if they end up picking things that are completely outside the scope of your business. I'll tell a very quick story. When I, when I took over the Kraft Foods Foundation, we had about 1,000 grants um, across the US and around the world. Um, and we were funding everything from golf tournaments to the opera to the whatever else. And I said, you know, it's a, I called it, to the board, a dog's breakfast, right? This is what it looked like. It was a dog's breakfast. We were all over the place. Now, at some point in time, I am sure that every one of those grants actually made sense 
to somebody to do, and many of them were like locally important, right? But if our goal was to actually establish craft as being a leading global player on an issue, we needed to get alignment, and we needed to be able to put the full assets of the organization behind it in order to achieve it and scale it. And so we ended up taking all of the foundation resources and really focusing on the single thing that really united every one of our businesses, which was malnutrition. And malnutrition actually means two things. It's about undernutrition, which is usually called hunger, and it's about overnutrition, which is usually called obesity. And if you looked at the portfolio of Kraft Foods, those were the two things that we delivered, right? We had a lot of foods that were actually in the developing world, very good for nutritional um, additives and supplements, and they actually helped children's health. And then we had a lot of stuff that is really yummy, but it was absolutely not necessarily in the healthy scale, right? So we were fighting obesity, we were fighting uh, over and under nutrition. We aligned everything behind that, and now I could take the entire business into trying to solve this social problem, as opposed to just having the foundation look at some programs over here. That's powerful. That's really an important point. Another one is, um, in the spirit of engaging with our members, what's your thoughts on conducting surveys to gauge their levels of interest in various needs and, and services? Uh, well, first of all, I absolutely loved the, the, the survey, and I wish I'd thought about it, um, the new employee engagement survey, right, where you got to pick all of your favorite hand gestures. Um, I thought that was <laughs> fabulous. But um, I'm not saying that's what we're going to do in all the branches, but I do think that it is really, really important to figure out what is the right way to engage your customers and consumers. You saw my second action point was to talk to co-op and figure out if you do want to do consumer or customer research, either in your branch or with your customers and consumers, let's give you some ideas on how to do that in ways that are not overly complicated, right? It doesn't have to be overly complicated. Some of them will be online. Some of them can be in person. Some of them can be done by your employees during work hours. Some of them will be done other ways. Um, but I think the important thing is you just have to be able to listen. You have to be able to listen and understand exactly what people are saying. So I think surveying is critical, but I think you also have to think about what's the right vehicle um, to use to actually get the data you want. Because sometimes people, you know, if you think about it, um, for years, everybody would do the data and they'd say, um, would you buy this product if you want to save the environment? Would everybody say, oh, I'd pay more to save the environment. Of course I would, right? But you're ask, they ask the questions in a way where it was, would you, would you or would you like to? Or do, this one I loved. Do you care about the environment, right? OK, I don't care about whether you care about the environment. There is nobody who's going to say, I don't care about the environment. OK, there might be a few people these days, but mostly everyone's going to say they care. But that is not necessarily the same thing as they saying, I am going to buy. I'm going to change how I think, feel, or do something because of the environment. We are looking for a social issue that is so powerful and so relevant that it is going to make your consumer or customer think, feel, or do something different because you engaged with them on that issue. Yep. Uh, next one from Eric is that uh, credit unions are immersed in the community. Uh, should, should a credit union focus on one big initiative or multiple smaller ones? I have a bias um, towards fewer, bigger, better. I fully admit that. I think it's very tough to own a space. There's so much clutter in the marketplace these days. I think it's very tough to own a space um, if you are just scattered across a thousand things. Um, but I also know in very small communities, okay, so uh, a story. I lived in Russia for uh, three years. It was a very tough three years. Um, and back then, this was decades ago, um, back then, um, one of the uh, mayors in one of these cities out in Siberia, uh, what he really needed was a fire truck. Okay? He needed a fire truck. Now, my client was not a fire truck maker. My client was not in any business that was vaguely related to fire trucks. But the truth is that the number one need in that community was a fire truck. So if you were going to go into that community and make a charitable donation, it was quite clear that that was the item that would make the biggest difference. So did I tell him, oh, wait, don't do that, that's a stupid idea, even though it's clearly the most impactful thing for this entire teeny community? No, I said, that's fine, that's what you should do, that's fine. So there are choices, there are times when um, there will be in some small communities the opportunity to do a one-off thing that really is noteworthy and makes a big difference in people's lives. But overall, 
And for those of you in big cities, for certain, you have got to be doing fewer, bigger, better things, or you will never break through the clutter. You will never own anything. You will never be identified solely with an issue. And if you are not known for it, if you don't stand for it, it's really hard to get people to then have the awareness to actually get to understanding, to actually get to belief, to actually get to action. Next one from Steve. This is, this is going to be an, an important topic because it's, 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 it always comes into social purpose a lot in that once we've defined our social purpose, how do we balance humble versus arrogant in sort of the way we communicate our, our messages? I think that, um, first of all, I think everything in the social initiative world is largely ending up done in partnership, right? Um, it's, you know, you can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? And we've learned that from so many of these partnerships that, for example, if you give things away for free, um, and we learned this through a lot of work we've done in Africa and other places, um, it's not valued. Um, and so people don't actually take care of it, they don't respect it, so we built a bunch of wells, um, and those wells didn't end up lasting because they had not been, we had gone in, we had kind of helicoptered in, built the wells for them and said, oh, congratulations, isn't this great, whatever. Um, Everything needs to be thoughtful in terms of the partnership that you put together. And I think because of that, uh, when you're working in partnership, it's a lot easier to be humble because it's not all you. You're never going to be saying, look what I did. Aren't I great, right? Does that make anybody feel really, really good? Do you love people who say that, right? I'm not going to say that we have a presidential candidate right now that really seems to be able to do that well. But, you know, I mean, think about it, right? Do we all love him? Okay, some people do. I get that. But... It's got to be something where you are, if you are genuinely doing something in the community interest and with partners, then it is okay to be proud. And I think there's a big difference between bragging and proud. And I don't think for years and years, when I came into um, to craft and even at Unilever, everybody told me, we don't communicate about the foundation. That's like beating your chest. That's like a bad thing. Do you know, in the last decade, that has completely changed. Complete, I, I disagree with it from the beginning because I was a communicator. I said, we are going to tell our story. It's all about telling your story properly. Um, and I think you need to understand that just bravado and claiming it's all you, that is never going to make anybody happy. But talking about how you are helping others, talking about how you're working in partnership with people, making it something that is like collective impact, and then talking about that in a good way, that's not going to do anything but good. It, I mean, the biggest tip on that is, is I versus we, right? S yes. Saying, hey, I did this great thing versus we did this great thing. Your credit union, it's, it's a we. Correct. So Excellent point. That's, that's a, it. A better summary. There you go. <laughs> I versus we. we. Next one from uh, Tim is credit unions are, are big supporters of the Children's Miracle Network hospitals. Uh, what do you think of that as a sort of a unifying cause for credit unions? The truth is, I, I don't have the research to know. Uh, I don't know the background. Why did you originally get into it? I don't know what it is designed to drive. So as I talked about objectives, if it was designed to, um, to drive, for example, employee engagement or retention or something like that, it may be a great program. Is it driving demand? Is it driving consumer purchase? Is it driving repeat purchase or increased purchase or preference? I don't, I don't have the data, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I don't know that it is. That doesn't make it an initiative that you shouldn't do, and it doesn't make it an initiative that doesn't have other value. But I think you just have to be, for every initiative you do, I think you have to be really, really clear what do you want it to accomplish. And in some communities, it may be exactly the right thing to do. Um, but you have to know that. You shouldn't just you know, kind of fall back into it because it's something you've always done. I think that's the one caution I would give you. Just because you've always done something doesn't mean it's the right thing to continue to do, but it also isn't meaning that you throw the baby out with the bathwater. There is nothing that says absolutely it's not right just because we did it for 10 years. Right. Um, right. So I have a thought on that, uh, Perry, and something that, because since we've been working together, we've been thinking about this, and at Co-op, we're a huge supporter of Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. And one thing that I thought about and kind of reverse engineering the positioning on this, and I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but I think credit unions have supported children's hospitals because what we're doing is giving money to families who cannot pay to care for sick or injured children. So we're, we're helping people not get into financial trouble because of a health care issue. And I think if we just reshape the positioning on that, it might work in our favor and help drive demand. That's reverse engineering 
process, but I think that does connect back to credit unions, and it could be something that we think about as an industry, and it's something that we're testing with this research to see how this is something we've been doing all together for many, many years. How could we shape this in a different way? So a thought. And, I, I, and you're absolutely right, and the research will tell, right? If it says that does play, then that's what you should continue to do, absolutely. And in certain places, it'll play um, you know, better than others. Thank you. So, Karine, in your line of work, do you often see um, uh, organizations that choose, say, purposes or causes because of a total internal bias? I mean, I, I'm literally, I, I've seen it before where a CEO says, I like riding bicycles in Sri Lanka, so that's going to be our cause. That was standard operating procedure 15 years ago. In fact, I would tell you there probably wasn't any big company in the world that didn't have a significant portion of their charitable giving directed in some way or shape or form by their senior executives. That's exactly what happened. Um, today, I think that when you look at foundations, and I was thrilled that this is what happened while I was working at Unilever and Kraft, people realized, boards began to realize, you know, if we're giving $400 million, uh, if we're spending all of this money, this is not a small chunk of change. Why would there not be an ROI associated with that in the same way that there's an ROI associated with every other thing that we do? So what happened is, under scrutiny, people then had to begin to defend, why do we do what we do? Um, and it had to tie to a business value. Uh, and so some of those ones I listed on the chart, I've seen all of those work. But what I will tell you is that was my strongest weapon when I had to kill 900 programs in a year. Um, that's 900 separate grants that we got out of over the total of a three-year period without a single public backlash. Because what we did was we researched what was the single most compelling thing that we could do and then when we went to have to tell these charities that we were no longer going to be doing what they did, we could explain it, and it was very rational. So it wasn't that the opera wasn't great. It was that we, as a company, needed to feed kids who didn't have enough food to go to school, right? And it, it kind of, it, it was like, ah, it was like kind of, it's about the food, right? If you're a fast food restaurant. It was so obvious in the end that people, people got it, and we also then exited very smartly, very respectfully. We gave them time. We helped them find other funders, et cetera. But I do think that historically, there has been a huge amount uh, that has been done at the behest or because of senior leaders liking certain things, believing certain things. This isn't just about pet projects. They really believed it was the right thing for the business to do. But when you do the research from a consumer lens, you do often find that um, actually, it, it's not really what the consumer cares most about to drive purchase. That's so interesting. Unfortunately, we're, we're kind of out of time, which is I feel like we could talk about this forever. Um, I just want to wrap this with kind of a personal question because you're a real straight talker and you're obviously very successful. <laughs> uh, it's, not that, it's not that personal, but um, I know that you're, you know, you're entering into partnership into partnership with co-op and so I know as a consultant also like every project you take on there's like a personal element of I'm really excited about this or not so much about this but what does this partnership mean to you is it is it different or similar from other work you do what are you looking forward to um, I think that the um, mechanics of the work are very similar to the work that we do um, uh, what I think is interesting, and one of the benefits um, that I have had for my 30 years in big corporate um, is that that has bought me the privilege of now actually only doing work that I really believe in. I don't have to take a single client that I don't want or that I don't believe in. Um, and it's also let me follow my pet passion, which is this intersection between business and society. Um, and so for me, when I look at co-op, um, one, I, I truly believe you have one of the best untold stories. Um, and when you look at your industry, dear God, we need some good stories, right? I mean, it's like there's just not a lot of good stories in finance recently. Um, so to me, it's personally about thinking about how many people and how many lives will be better off if they actually had better financial bases, right? So whether that's getting a better product, but getting more education, not uh, falling subject to predatory loans, whatever. Um, and, uh, and that's why I said, literally, it's true. I will move um, you know, one of my accounts to a credit union because I, I want to see how it goes, but I think that you guys have a great opportunity here. You heard it, folks. Thank you, Perry. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks.